good afternoon and good evening to one and all present here welcome to the third session of evaluating the strategic partnership after the porto summit learnings from the high level eu india leaders meeting 2021 my name is kanchi batra business editor the diplomatic magazine it is a great honor for me to open the third session and give you a very warm welcome i am particularly pleased to welcome the chair and all the speakers who have honored us by taking part in this discussion we had a very fruitful session uh, for session this afternoon now we are we are deeply concerned that the covid-19 pandemic with new strains continue to have severe impact on business and society pandemic has highlighted economic inequalities societal divisions and disruptions in the international order as we have all joined here we have an opportunity today to discuss how both the regions can catch on a great opportunity the new world order offers and to give fresh energy to the eu india relations we are of a strong view that despite the disruptions called caused by the pandemic to the global economy the india eu relationship is set to witness an extraordinary push we hope that this session would set new opportunities to strengthen and enhance cooperation between india and eu now i have the distinct pleasure of calling the chair and moderator for this session ambassador anil wadwa former indian ambassador to italy and san marigo poland and lithuania ambassador wadwa we look forward to the positive outcome of your deliberations the virtual platform is all yours over to you thank you thank you very much uh, kanchi for this uh, kind introduction and um, i would like to welcome all the panelists for this third session of uh, the event of the diplomatist uh, on evaluating the strategic partnership after the porto summit uh, learnings from the 16th india eu summit uh, 2021 uh, now as we all know um, uh, the uh, uh, first ever india eu summit meeting uh, was held uh, in the 27 plus one format and that happened on the 8th of may 2021 and that is the focus of our discussions today um technology including collaboration in uh, 5g supercomputing and artificial intelligence data privacy network security partnership and vaccines uh, reform of multilateral institutions uh, climate change and sustainability besides the indo pacific of course were amongst the subjects that were taken up for these discussions um and uh, there are three or four important takeaways as we all know uh, first of all the eu and india have agreed to resume negotiations for a, a balanced ambitious uh, comprehensive and mutually beneficial trade agreement uh, which would uh, respond to the current challenges and also the two sides have agreed that it was imperative to find uh, solutions for long standing market access issues so the comprehensive trade agreement uh, will have the components of trade uh investment protection uh, uh, investment protection and geographical indications but of course uh, we must also keep in mind that no timeline was uh, announced and it has been left to the high level mechanism led by the trade ministers to steer these negotiations uh, we know that eu is india's largest trading partner and india is the eu's ninth largest trading partner uh and uh, in 2019 uh, the bilateral trade in goods had actually touched 115 billion dollars now of course last year it has come down and trade in services was estimated at that point at uh, 40 billion dollars as well um so the eu has cumulatively in invested 91 billion dollars into india and uh, our panelists can address uh, the issue of what is the way forward and the expectations from these negotiations that you have yet another highlight of this summit was the launch of the india eu connectivity partnership uh, which will entail the india and eu working on joint projects in in africa in central asia and in the indo pacific etc and uh, in the vision document we also have an agreement by india and eu uh, to build a sustainable uh, comprehensive connectivity partnership which is based on rule of law uh, and fiscal and environmental transparency 
they will jointly work on regulation and support for private investments in physical infrastructure across all sectors, digital, transport, energy, and people-to-people -people programs. Uh, so quality infrastructure, socioeconomic benefits from sustainable growth, and shared norms and values were all emphasized. Now, we must remember that the combined market size of India and the EU is 1.8 billion people, and the combined GDP is about 16.5 uh, trillion euro. And the EU itself provides uh, about 414 billion of global aid, and its partnership with Japan and the United States is seen as an alternative to the BRI. So will this partnership with India add to that vision and how uh, should the two sides proceed in the future? The third issue is the growing convergence in the Indo-Pacific between India and the EU. And uh, India and the EU have uh, underscored their commitment to a free, open, inclusive, and rules-based Indo-Pacific space, uh, undermined by respect for territorial integrity, sovereignty, uh, democracy, rule of law, transparency, uh, freedom of navigation and over, uh, overflight, and unimpeded uh, lawful commerce and peaceful resolution of disputes. And this is all in accordance with the international law that includes the UNCLOS. So India has welcomed the EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, and the EU has expressed appreciation for India's Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative. Uh, the EU is, of course, laying stress on maritime domain awareness and information sharing in this region with its strategic partners. And individually, we've seen uh, France, uh, UK, uh, Germany, Holland, uh, all uh, coming out with their own Indo-Pacific strategies. They can all be strategic partners of the Quad countries as well in this region. So we need to hear from the panelists as to how the EU uh, will approach the issue of Indo-Pacific in the future. Lastly, I want to touch upon another agreement, which is to shore up India's capacity for production of uh, anti-COVID vaccines. Uh, the EU, of course, has agreed to keep uh, an open mind on TRIPS waiver uh, for the vaccines. Uh, and, but at the same time, there, there were doubts which were expressed by the EU leadership on whether this will help um, access, giving access to vaccines and instead uh, there were some calls on countries manufacturing doses to ramp up uh, production and delivery. Uh, so in order to prepare for the global health emergencies, the two sides have agreed, of course, to work together on resilient uh, medical supply chains, vaccines, and the active pharmaceutical ingredients, and also on the application of international uh, good manufacturing standards to ensure high quality and safety of the products. And then the climate change and increasing funding uh, of India of green uh, and sustainable means of transport by the European Investment Bank were also covered in the talks, as was the greening uh, of the railways, uh, ports and shipping sectors, and the decarbonization of civil aviation. These are all very far reaching uh, areas. So our pa panelists could specifically address these issues, in particular, the issue of the TRIPS waiver for the vaccine and how they see it proceeding in the future. Um, we all know that the focus of this panel is on four topics. Number one, Europe, a key ally of India. Number two, the EU-India uh, Indo-Pacific Triangle. Uh, number three, India, Europe, and the liberal order. And fourth, a soft power approach in India-EU relations. So um, I would request the panelists to specifically address these topics. Uh, so to discuss these issues today, we have a very accomplished panel. Uh, each panelist will have 10 minutes for remarks. And I do hope that all of you will stick to the time, which has been allocated very strictly. Uh, for the audience, questions will be taken at the end of the session, and participants will have the opportunity to ask questions, make some comments uh, through the chat function and also the Q&A box. So without further ado, uh, let me uh, first call upon uh, Ambassador of India, uh, Ambassador of Italy to India, His Excellency Vincenzo De Luca, uh, for his remarks. So Excellency, you have the floor first. Thank you very much, Ambassador Vado, and uh, world, uh, welcome to all our colleagues and speakers today and the audience. Uh, I think we are, we are experiencing uh, 
a momentum in the partnership between European Union and India. We have been developing in the last 20 years a special partnership started in uh, the year two, uh, 2000, but in the very last few years, and this year in particular, we have made a lot of progress in this partnership that has become more and more a strategic partnership between the European Union and India, a comprehensive partnership, and also uh, a partnership where uh, the two uh, players, Europe, European Union and India, have been building a very high degree of confidence, of trust, of mutual commitment. Why is a strategic partnership? Because when we talk about uh, energy, when we talk about uh, uh, advanced technology and also regulated sectors in the economy, unless you have a very high level of mutual trust and political commitment, will be very difficult to promote and to enhance such a partnership. And this is very important because if we see also the negotiation before Oporto summit, of course, we had a lot of, we have, we have still some, of course, points and challenge in really integrating, integrating, further integrating our economy and our <coughs> in our technology. But when we have decided together, European Union and India, to have a comprehensive agreement to start negotiation on trade, investment, and geographical indication, we have been able to go, let's say, beyond the technical challenge and still points to be worked and discussed together. There's been a political impulse in this direction uh, before and during uh, the summit. And I think we have to be also grateful to the Portuguese presidency to have facilitated this important outcome. Uh, in Europe, we have uh, had a very uh, positive uh, reaction in Italy, in France, in Germany, all over the countries, I think, of the outcomes of this summit because now we have uh, launched a sort of long-term strategic partnership, identifying also the area where this partnership should be developed. This is a partnership not only at the level of European Union and India, but also in the framework of Indo-Pacific region. So we're even more strategic, strategic in, the, in this sense. And this is an ambitious partnership because, as I said before, we are talking about sector where unless you have a high level of political commitment, it's very difficult to make progress and to integrate economy and technology. I think Europe can share with India in a long-term view technology, regulation experience, because do not forget that Europe has been one of the first market in the world to be regulated in a way that allows more investment, for example, in energy and transport and communication. We ex have experienced the so-called unbundling between the producer, the, the uh, transmission uh, operator, the Uh, distribution operator, that means an advanced model to encourage investment. This is an, an example on how the two areas can uh, share the, the experience and also uh, work for more uh, sustainable investment in Europe and in India. And also European Union and India are experiencing similar policy and programs Uh, the policy of the Modi government very much uh, focus on uh, uh, energy transition and sustainable development, very much linked on uh, sustainable development goals and uh, Paris Agreement commitments. And the same in Europe, where we are working 
very hard in contributing to the achievement of the SDGs and the Paris Agreement commitment. We have also similar perspective vis-à-vis uh, -vis the recovery after COVID because in Europe we focus our um, economic stimulus on so-called next generation EU that is a program, ambitious program on digitalization, ecological transition, inclusiveness and social to address social imbalances. The same also here in India. And also on the health policy, we have shared experience, particularly Italy with India after the COVID crisis in Italy, we start to share experience and also work together also in these very days in uh, promoting vaccination, in exchanging experience. European Union and India are the two areas where we had the highest number of export of vaccine, 45 million from Europe, 60 million from India. So we are also fundamental in uh, promoting access to va vaccination all over the world with the COVAX program and the financing from Europe and in India with the production and exportation of vaccine. So there are several elements and dimensions to describe this uh, 360 uh, partnership, these comprehensive agreements, this uh, long-term strategy between European Union and India. And also in the Indo-Pacific, we shared uh, a commitment in several uh, uh, multilateral organizations. I think Indo-Pacific is an area where we have a multipolar uh, dimension. We have to promote shared value of uh, rule of law, transparency, level playing field. And these are the basis of the common commitment in uh, reinforcing uh, connectivity, also offering uh, diversified corridors of connection in this area. And uh, in this uh, perspective, of course, uh, we can have uh, a commitment from also the financial European institution like the European Investment Bank, but also of uh, an investment bank from the European Union member states our GDP, the Italian Investment Bank, uh, in the last bilateral digital summit, the 6th of November 2020, signed an agreement with the NIIF, that is an Indian fund, to co-finance investment in infrastructure. When we talk about connectivity, uh, also there, we have a very large spectrum of uh, fields, starting from energy, uh, maritime transportation, aviation, electricity interconnection, also in all these fields for the connection in the India, but also in the region and between uh, um, the Indo-Pacific and Europe. And also, this is very important, is also in a new element of our partnership, Cooperation in third countries like Africa, where Europe is very much present, Italy is very much present, and India has an increasing role, especially in the Horn of Africa and in other countries. So there is a, a perspective and the dimension of further um, cooperation and collaboration between the European Union and India. And uh, the uh, last summit in Oporto have given really a political impulse to do more, to work in a, a very uh, concrete and pragmatic way, also identifying projects in the different areas, working on the trade, investment, and geographical indication agreements, and uh, uh, let's say open the way to uh, a, a further strategic integration, both the economic, uh, culture, and social uh, uh, field. Also, people to people is another important dimension of the cooperation between uh, uh, Europe and India. We have worked also in this regard uh, with, uh, between Italy and uh, India in the framework of the European Union and India uh, partnership. So we have a multi-dimension kind of strategic partnership. We have all the base to work together in the coming months and years. And we are here today in these very days to help India with the support for the materials now very much needed here, oxygen, uh, medical uh, uh, materials, 
and all the help we can uh, provide uh, from Italy, from Europe. We have activated the European Union civil protection mechanism for the first time, I think, in such an effective way from all over the European Union countries, Germany, France, Italy, all the countries, Malta, and other also country of the European Union. I, for the time being, stop here, and thank you so much for inviting me to, very, to this very interesting debate. Excellency Vincenzo De Luca, thank you so much for uh, those very comprehensive remarks. Um, you touched upon a whole lot of issues that were agreed upon uh, during this uh, meeting and uh, the way forward for India-EU relationship. Uh, next on my list is um, His Excellency Ruben Rao, Chief the High Commissioner of Malta in India. A welcome, first of all, to India, Excellency. I haven't had a chance to meet you so far, knew your predecessor very well, and we happen to be neighbors as well in Panchil Pan. But um, uh, hope to see you soon, and uh, although you've already spent a lot of time, uh, due to the COVID, uh, obviously the activities outside the embassy are a little restricted. I'd like to welcome you now to give your remarks, and um, uh, you know, please, if you can cover uh, as much as you can on the four topics that are before us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your uh, kind words. I've been in India now for eight months. Uh, I've already met a number uh, of people and made a number of friends. Uh, I'm seeing Ambassador Dinash Patnaik. We met almost immediately when, when I arrived. Um, I wish to be more uh, active outside of the you know, the walls of my high commission in view, but obviously in view of the fact that COVID is, is keeping us, is keeping us segregated from each other, which is, uh, which is one of the main tragedies of COVID, I would say, that it is uh, disallowing human contact. Uh, we believe in, uh, you know, when we speak about country and country friendship, Finally, it has to be the people who have to be friends. So a country cannot be a friend with another country if there aren't any people contact. So uh, let's hope that uh, COVID will very soon leave us alone uh, and allow us to uh, continue with our real diplomatic work. In relation to the uh, summit, uh, especially on the topic of Europe, a key ally for India. I would also like to say that we can say it also the other way around. India is a key ally to Europe. Malta welcomes the enhancement of EU-India relations and fully supports the strategic partnership aimed at enhancing bilateral ties and cooperation on issues of common interest within a broader foreign policy agenda as in fact the joint statement of the summit envisaged. India undoubtedly remains an important international and regional player. And my personal belief, and I don't think that it is only my personal belief, is that uh, India will become more uh, internationally uh, active in the future. Its current the current membership of India in the UN Security Council, the Human Rights Council, and the G20 presidency in 2023 are important opportunities to boost further our cooperation in international fora to uphold and bolster multilateralism and international law. As the title says, Europe a key ally for India India a key ally for Europe. Since my arrival here eight months ago, I can say and I can feel that uh, India and Europe agree possibly more than we believe we agree. Before I came here, I was in a place which is also making the headlines at the moment. I was in uh, Jerusalem, Ramallah. And over there, apart from the problems on the ground, which are unfortunately now manifesting themselves very, very visibly. 
even the EU within itself uh, was had problems in uh, finding denominators of agreement. This does not happen here in India. Uh, so that is why I came up with the uh, sentence that we probably agree, we, I mean the EU and India, probably agree more than we believe we agree. There are obviously uh, points of disagreement, technical points, but finally the basis of agreement between us is very, very strong. Uh, I'm saying this as the as a high commissioner of a country uh, which is a member of the EU, I can also say it between as, as, as the high commissioner of a country of Malta with India, even Malta and India. I mean, we have a common past uh, in the European Union. Now that uh, well, that the UK is is out, the two countries mainly which share with India uh, the Commonwealth uh, background are now my country, Malta and Cyprus. In fact, that is why I am called High Commissioner. I would like to say, talking about the bilateral relations between uh, Malta and India, I don't want to delve into that a lot, but Malta has proudly supported India's candidature for its current memberships of the United Nations Security Council and the Human Rights Council. And I would like to underline that we see future roles for India within the United Nations. I will leave it at that. Together, the EU and India can work hand in hand to advance the achievement of sustainable development goals at all levels. In this context, we consider as essential an effective and inclusive rules-based multilateral system to tackling current and future global challenges with the United Nations at its core. As you can see, the uh, United Nations uh, are mentioning them relatively, relatively regularly. The complementarity of regional dialogue should also be underlined and look forward to enhancement of our dialogue in important fora, such as the Asia-Europe meeting. Malta joined this meeting when we joined the European Union in 2004. This is also important in the context of the EU strategy for cooperation with the Indo-Pacific region and the need to promote international coordination and cooperation in this context. Here I would also like to mention uh, that we also consider important our close coordination on regional issues of mutual interest, such as the prevention of the, so, sorry, excuse me, such as the preservation of the Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA, as well as the developments in our respective neighborhoods. The, uh, my colleague, the Italian ambassador mentioned Africa, uh, Italy's presence in Africa, Italy's interest in Africa. Malta, like Italy, we are neighbors with Italy and our interest in Africa is uh, uh, very deep. And Africa is a case in point where we can achieve a win-win situation through our shared interest in a prosperous, peaceful, democratic, and resilient Africa. Malta fully embraces the need to enhance synergies in our cooperation with African partners, and most especially uh, by joining forces uh, with India. The strengthening of our strategic partnership at the EU level is an important and welcome development. If the past year has taught us anything, it is that we are stronger together. We should take the opportunity to enhance our dialogue mindful also of the threats to global peace and security and the benefits of bilateral and multilateral cooperation. We see this as an important opportunity to further deepen our relationship based on common shared values. And there again, common shared values. Uh, India is the largest democracy in the world. The European Union is a group of democratic countries. 
So our shared values are there, more probably than we think. And this is, the, I mean, just to touch a little bit on the subject of, soft, of the soft power approach. The European Union is in itself is a product of soft power. The European Union is a product of attraction. Uh, states join the European Union through referenda. Uh, they join the European Union through attraction. They want to be in it. They're not forced to be in it. They're not annexed in it. On the contrary. And in fact, as we've seen, uh, states stay in the European Union as long as they feel they want to stay. Uh, we've seen the case of the UK, uh, they left the European Union. So everything is based on attraction, everything is based on the will to be a part of a group. And obviously, the same applies to India-EU relations. Both sides, I'm sure, feel the need to have relations with each other. I mean, talking, for instance, about the connectivity. Uh, the European Union also has connectivity with Japan, but from what I read, the connectivity with India is becoming deeper and larger than uh, the connectivity with Japan at the moment. So I don't want to take a lot of your time, and uh, please forgive me, as, as uh, Ambassador Anil said, I'm new, so I, don't have, I may not have the uh, insight as, for instance, my, my colleague, uh, the, the Italian Ambassador, I wish from the bottom of my heart, uh, first of all, I would like to thank also the Portuguese presidency for uh, organizing the summit, which was a godsend. And uh, it is very, very encouraging to see that there was even agreement that the trade agreement will, be, will continue to be discussed and hopefully uh, we will get over our uh, technical uh, detail, uh, our technical disagreements and come up with that, because that would be a big, big milestone in EU-India uh, relations and the milestone of soft power. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Excellency. Uh, that was uh, very nicely said. Uh, you know, you laid out a lot of ground on in terms of uh, collaboration, particularly uh, with your country, uh, with India. And I think it's a very uh, broad vision uh, that has been laid out for us uh, following this meeting. And I'm sure uh, uh, together the EU countries will contribute to this uh, grand vision going forward. Thank you very much. Uh, and now I'd like to turn to uh, uh, our uh, good friend, Ambassador um, Dinesh Patnaik. Uh, he is the, heads the uh, Indian Council for Cultural Relations and is a very dynamic diplomat in the Indian Foreign Service. Uh, just recovered from COVID, but still uh, found it fit to come and speak to us today. So welcome, Dinesh. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ambassador Vodwa. It's always good to see you. And Ambassador Vincent Joe and Ruben, uh, it's a pleasure seeing both of you. You know, I've been listening to this uh, discussion from the morning, from two o'clock onwards. I seem to have a lot of free time, so I sat down and listened to all of it. And I find we are discussing the same things over and over again. You know, the same trade negotiations, connectivity, Indo-Pacific security and strategy issues, pharma, healthcare, people to people connectivity. And all of us are saying the same thing. So I thought I'll go a little off syllabus because, you know, these, all these things that we discussed in this summit this time, we're all in the roadmap 2025 that was released last year. You know, this is just a reiteration of whatever was in the roadmap. The roadmap is clearly there for us. It was there last year on all the issues that are there. And those, that roadmap encompasses everything. I mean, if you look at it, it encompasses political issues, security and strategic issues, trade and economic issues, discussions on IT, pharma, cybersecurity, innovation, climate change, everything. It's a, it's a roadmap of all the... Many, many issues that India and you work together. And yet, on all of these negotiations, we know our positions. We've been doing it for a long, long time. There are 
many differences. There are vested interests at work. There are business interests at work. There are political views, difference in outlooks. There are country interests. Some countries have interest in stopping the negotiations. Some countries have. So these are issues which we'll keep on dealing with. But yet, what I find is the issues on which we don't have much difference. Issues on which we can move forward on things we can do actually very well. We do not focus on that so much. And uh, so I'm going to speak of those issues because I have found that, you know, uh, reiterating what everybody else is saying is going to be more of nothing. So I'm going to speak on the issues on which actually we have a lot in commonality, where there is a lot of interest together, where we don't have much differences, but on which we need to focus more. We're not focusing enough on those. If we can focus on that, and that actually comes to the core of India-EU relationship, which is connectivity, people-to-people -people connectivity. All of you have said it. Ambassador Vincenzo said it. Uh, Ambassador Robin said it. It is very important that we work on these connectivity. And what are the three things that I'm going to talk about three things because time is limited. One is first is cultural cooperation. Second is academic cooperation. Third is cooperation and democracies. You know, these, these three cooperation are areas on which we have very little differences, lot of commonality, yet we are not doing anything. Let me start with, let's say, cultural cooperation. There is no pan-India-European cultural cooperation. Every cooperation is bilateral. We have bilateral deals with Italy, we have bilateral deals, but there is no pan-India-European cultural cooperation. Uh, most of the cultural cooperation is also done by civil society, by cultural organizations, by NGOs, by individuals, by impresarios, by performers. There is no effort at the government level at the top to have a regular interaction on cultural matters between India and Europe. Uh, there is no major India-Europe cultural festival, neither in performing arts, in art shows, in theaters. There is no program which is held regularly. Uh, if you really look at it, uh, the EU's own report says that almost 5% of the EU's GDP comes from cult cultural sectors. In fact, for some countries, it is much more. For countries like Italy, they look at almost 10 to 12% of the GDP coming from cultural sectors. Uh, Spain, all these countries have a large amount coming in, but the amount of money we actually spend in putting together cultural cooperation is very limited. And whatever happens is event-based. It's sporadic and there are no long-term cooperation because what we need is to have long-term cooperation, to embed culture in each other's organizations. What do we need? We need to place, uh, put in place cooperation among dance academies, music conservatories, theater groups, Department of Fine Arts of universities, galleries, museums. I mean, I can go on. The list is endless. All these things need to work together regularly on a regular basis, exchanging, bringing together artists, bringing together people, because that is at the core of the heart of the relationship between India and Europe. I mean, we did a small thing. There's a Casa de la India in Spain, which is doing brilliant work. That's a model which can be replicated in all European countries. It's a model which we can do in India. There is so much activity being taken by all the cultural centers. The Italian cultural center is very active. The Hungarian, the British Council, all in France, Goethe, all of them active. But we don't work together. We don't put it together and have a pan-India European plan of action on cultural cooperation. We need to do this because we need regular festivals where we need to put in regular every year, uh, in the European festival, in pop arts, in dance and music festivals, literary festivals, art residencies, and this should be held every year with all groups vying to participate in that. You know, that creates a forum between India and Europe, which is really something unbeatable. And we need more joint collaborations, you know, like Kathak Flamenco collaboration that we did with Spain. You know, Kathak dancers and Flamenco dancers, we need new forms of art, music, joint productions, experimental moves, experimental notes, experimental music, you know, things which both at the bottom level and at the artistic level, everybody works together. And more than this, this is just the performing part. What we need is capacity building. You know, Europe has a great capacity in culture management, in archaeology conservation, in museum management, in event management, you know, you name it. The entire capacity building uh, network in Europe is superb. Why are we not having more cooperation in actually increasing Indian capacity in these issues? This is, again, list is endless. I mean, I can go on. But when we talk of capacity building, let me come to my second thing, which is academic cooperation. Because academic cooperation is very, very, very important. There has been growing cooperation. Uh, the number of students who are going to Europe has increased by a huge amount. 
you know, Germany, which used to get about a thousand, two thousand students, reached eighteen thousand students. Spain getting large number of students. Even Italy, if you look at it, even in smaller places, there are large number of Indian students. There are lots of Indian students today studying in Europe, despite language barriers, despite everything. There are large number of Indians studying. But what is it happening? It's mostly Indians going there, and mostly for engineering and medical sciences. There are very few Europeans who come to India to study, who come to India to do uh, research or activities. Um, you know, this also engineering. Most of the focus is on engineering, medical sciences, science and technology. Where is there on humanities, on liberal arts, on the basic, on economics? There are very few cooperation that is happening between both sides. Or, for an example, Indology. Indology. Italy was the place where Indology all started. Sanskrit, the oldest university in Europe, is in. Uh, Italy, uh, Germany was a center for Indology. Poland, you know, it everywhere. UK, these were centers which used to study. But what is happening? All this has come down. We need to get out. And even in India, where is there? Which universities? All of your ambassadors here. Tell me which universities are doing social, historical, economic, philosophical study of Europe and its institutions. Very few. It is part of. You know, we need to increase this academic European. Cooperation because this is this all feeds in because at the end of the day the negotiators for the different things that we are talking about whether it's trade negotiation security cooperation all this will come from this pool of academic intellectuals who will then feed into that unless we take care of the bottom uh, the rest we will keep on doing I mean think tank cooperation has increased there are a lot of think tanks now cooperation but university cooperation is what I am talking it and we need to do because at the end of the day Europe and India share the same values you know. Because we share the same values, we need to study them together. Rubin said very well: India is the largest democracy, and Europe is the largest group of democracies. I mean, if you look at it both together, democracy is a natural thing which we do together, and yet we are not studying it. And that comes to my third thing, which I've been talking about, which is democrat cooperation on democratic issues. Uh, for example, both India and uh, Europe look at it. Both are complex, heterogeneous entities. Where they are composed of linguistically, ethnically, and culturally diverse states. Each of us, I mean, we have a lot to learn from how Europe has got together. Europe has also a lot to learn how India has managed to stay together despite all it. Even today, Europe keeps on asking the question of how can we integrate, and yet India has shown it. So there is a lot we can learn from each other. These are things we need to work actively, and this is when I come to what's happening currently. What is happening? You are looking at. There's a rise of nationalism in both countries, both areas. There's a decline in secular values. Values. There is growing intolerance. All these are studied. These are not being studied at a bilateral level between both sides. And democratic institutions. What are we looking at? Is there, you know, uh, Europe to a large extent has set itself as a normative uh, power in world governance. It does not look at real political and military issues as much as a normative power. It looks at setting norms across the world. Yet in India, there's a feeling that when Europe looks at the world, it doesn't see much different between a democratic India and maybe authoritarian countries of others. In fact, there are some who believe that sometimes Europe actually focuses more on the authoritarian countries than on democratic countries. It should not be such. We should be working together. Where is there an annual democracy forum, let's say, between India and Europe, where you get together to share shared democratic traditions? Of how you came about, how democratic institutions function, how can you assist uh, other countries in becoming democratic, becoming more democratic? How can, how is democracy under challenge? What are the different things which are challenging? What can we share? How can civil society work together? These are things which we need to do because we both need to learn from each other. It's not that we are trying to say that each one of us has something to teach the other. As long as we start thinking that we can share things together, work on things together. And bring out a, a strategy for the future growth. We will be able to do a lot. Uh, I'm going to stop here, Ambassador Vadva, because I can go on and on. But my only hope is that these are the areas in which, if we can focus, the areas on which the differences are very little, interests are similar, and if we can focus, where governments have to put their money in, money where the mouth is, because this is exactly what needs a catalyst and improvement. The rest, all we can keep on negotiating. Till um, time comes to an end, and I know for sure what we've been doing last 20 years, we'll continue to do for the next 20 years. But their results we can show in these areas. So let's focus on this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for focusing on those three areas in particular on, on whole of Europe cultural uh, uh, 
uh, focus on India university cooperation and cooperation on democratic issues. You rightly said very little differences exist on these topics, and I think we should certainly make efforts towards these. Um, now, um, I would like to turn to Mr. Surin uh, Yade, member of the European Parliament, um, for his views um, on uh, the issues before us. Uh, you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. And uh, before I start my intervention, uh, please uh, let me express my sympathy with India. My thoughts and prayers go to the people of India in those uh, terrible days and, and weeks you are experienced uh, right now. My prayers for that it will stop uh, soon. And then, uh, having said that, first of all, of course, thank you very much for this uh, invitation and the opportunity to attend this meeting and, and speak here at this uh, virtual uh, meeting after uh, the summit in, in Portugal. Um, my, I'm here not as a, my capacity of being ambassador or anything else, but I am um, I'm chair of the European Parliament delegation to India, and I'm uh, founding chairman of the new European Indian Business Council, we're located in Brussels. So uh, that is, I think, the reason why I'm here. I'm here today. Um, I think it is maybe too. If you can use the word historical days, but I, I'll do it anyway. I mean, uh, I, am, I, took, uh, I took the task of becoming the chairman of the European Parliament's delegation to India. Uh, I took it because uh, I want really uh, to de be part of this journey to develop a closer bond and more business uh, cooperation between the European Union and India. And I mean, so many things has happened also before the summit. Now we can talk about historic days because our leaders from India and from Europe, they send out strong signals, not only to the populations in the European Union and to India, that we really mean business. Now we will have we re, uh, the resumption of the trade negotiations is something we just don't talk about anymore. We want to do it. And before the summit, as you all know, we had the summit last year and we have had the, this roadmap um, and there's, I think it's 187 bullet points in the roadmap. And now you can, you can begin to think that this is not just an idea. Our leadership in Europe and in India, they want this to, uh, to happen. Now, uh, there's uh, so many clever things that have been said uh, in those uh, three, four interventions before me. And I have, of course, some points and uh, hopefully... Uh, um, uh, that will uh, I will cover what you you want. Otherwise, chair, you can uh, just uh, ask me. Uh, otherwise, but as has been said for all uh, four speakers before me, we have this unleashed potential uh, for more trade between India and EU. And as rightly said, India um, EU is uh, India largest trading partner, but it's not uh, the opposite, the other way. And 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 I'm really sad to to see how. Uh, we do trade in Europe right now. We, we have a lot of trade with China. We, um, we, uh, we just got a new agreement with China. And to be honest with you, I think it should be the opposite around. We should do much more with India. We have much more in common with India. And I will, I will uh, elaborate a little on this because um, not only because India is a huge market for Europe, but it, it has also something to do with, with mindset. India is a reliable training partner. A trading partner is conducting uh, rule-based trading, um, and when we go outside Europe, I think we should we could focus much more on democracies. Um, I think this uh, summit uh, has just been held the eighth of May. It's also a strong signal to to China, and hopefully they get it. And really, I do hope that we will see some change in in uh, in trade relations going out from Europe. Uh, and uh, and not only or as uh, and we put the money where our mouth uh, are. Um, I mean, global trade ha has always dragged people out of uh, where they are to better living standards, and that will also be uh, the future for both India and for uh, for uh, for Europe. Um, this about being a, a democratic uh, strategic partner is uh, so. Uh, precious to me and so important that we also talk about it. As I said, India shares many values uh, with the European Union. 
and you have this rule-based trading system, you have bureaucracy, rule of law and human rights. And therefore, India is a natural partner for EU and we should support uh, each other in promoting these uh, values domestically and of course, um, and of course uh, ab abroad. Um, there's no doubt that uh, cooperation among liberal democracies will become a very real necessity. And I think the European Union and India, we have recognized this and we have said it uh, loudly by having this uh, summit with an outcome where our leaders, they, um, they uh, delivered, uh, you might say. Now, a lot has been said about uh, climate change and global uh, cross-border problems that requires uh, uh, common international solutions. And of course, we, we have to be uh, connected with India. We have to be a partner with India in the green transition. We have some technologies. I mean, India, you have all the engineers, you have some of the best brains in the world. We have a, we, we have, um, a, a sector that, that can plug and play with what's going on in, 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 in India. And we cannot, as uh, the European Union, uh, we, we have also to take responsibility to, to help India not to do the same mistakes as we have done. So, so because India naturally, due to your, your size, have a global impact on global emissions. So this is uh, what's not to like in it. I mean, we are on the same road and India is reaching out, and I think there could be some good coming out of this, also this partnership on the totally the, the, the green trend, uh, transition. Um, I could say a lot about companies going into India and why that's, I have a lot of examples I, uh, I will spare you for, I will not uh, uh, say something about it, I will go back to what can come out of uh, the, the summit as well. I mean, our president of the European Parliament, actually, he will also he can use this to reach out um, to the Lok Sabha so that we can uh, the European Union can have a closer um, connection and collaboration uh, with the Lok Sabha. And I think that's also that's also very important. Also, if you talk about uh, those things about culture and and how to change, you know, send young people from India to Europe and, and vice versa. So I, I think there's a lot to do on, on all levels in uh, the European partnership, uh, European Parliament. As um, a chair of uh, European uh, par Parliament's delegation to India, I see this as a kind of new start. Now, is, now starts all the hard work. Now we have you know the bones we have the we, we have the roadmap we have the summit and now we have to put some flesh on the bones and this is done by real people whether that is in Luxaba or if it's in the European Parliament or if it is uh, on a higher uh, level at a uh, president or prime minister's level and then of course we have to discuss what has also been touched upon and I started by uh, paying my uh, my respect and thoughts and prayers to the people of India, because we, we cannot just avoid the, the COVID discussion. I mean, uh, India have really provided uh, vaccines to hundreds of millions of people, have done a lot, and, and I'm, I'm, it's heartbreaking to see what's going on in India. And of course, as partners, we, we, have, we need to help each other, as you have helped countries in Europe to get the vaccines, we, we, you can also... Uh, uh, expect or you, you, you should demand that we also, you know, try to help India in this uh, very tough uh, situation. And, and there, there's this discussion uh, whether, you know, you can give up the rights for the vaccine and make sure that it be given to all. You could also look at in, in Europe, we could look into it in another way. We could also make sure that the companies who have, uh, you know, the, the legal rights, they get some money. I mean, what, what, what's not... Uh, there's nothing to lose and we have no uh, time to lose. So, so whether it costs some money for us to, to make sure that the vaccine will also go to India, we, we must do that because the money for the vaccine, that is the less problem. I mean, what's, what has happened, devastating for businesses, devastating for families, thousands of being, people have been uh, dead. So, so, so this is something where I expect our leaders to really start on a very fast and close relationship because that will show the people of India and also the people of Europe that we mean business and we do help each other when we have problems like this because this is the overwhelming problem uh, for, the, for, the time, uh, for the time being. Now, 
I have a lot of points to make and I know time is running and I think I've used my, my 10 minutes. But, but let me just say to you, I, I do hope we meet in the real life. I can assure you I will do as chairman the very best I can to promote and to develop closer uh, ties and relationship between the two biggest democracies in the world. And it has been an honor for me to be here today. And I'm also honored by having those two positions in these days where we try to do even better among uh, the two biggest democracies in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. And indeed, you occupy two very important positions uh, and you are in an ideal situation to take the trade relationship um, forward and also the vaccine collaboration, which you yourself pointed out between India and the European Union. And um, uh, we look forward to your uh, leadership with this regard in future. Uh, and now I'd like to turn to uh, Dr. Veena Ravi Kumar, uh, former uh, senior faculty at the University of Delhi, uh, for her views. Please, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been really a pleasure and honor to be amongst all of you. I'm the only non-ambassador, and I hope uh, I'll make some good points too. Uh, coming here, you know, so much has been covered, so I'll go straight into the point that the main identification of the problem uh, is that even though India is an admirer of EU and vice versa, uh, it has not reached its potential as it should or ought to, but one hopes that in the future it will. Of course, as uh, Ambassador from the ICCR said, uh, Indian culture thinking, spirituality have been high in European minds. So much research has gone into an institute, like he mentioned earlier, the South Asian University Heidelberg, one of the oldest, uh, Science Po, another one, to name just two, have done major amount of work and encouraged academics to interact. In contemporary international politics, with the perceived notion of the United States still trying to get on its feet, the EU most definitely has a strategic role to play in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Where the US today falls short, the EU can close the chasm for now and make a very big difference. Therefore, the linkage between the EU, India, ASEAN, the quadrilateral, is interrelated with linked commonalities and distinctiveness. India as the 10th, uh, part of the 10th partners have been chosen as a strategic partner with a total trade volume of 72.7 million euros, but that's in 2013. It hasn't really sat down till now where the ambassadors have been talking about it. So innovation issues such as energy, scientific research, things have been taking, taken up. A very optimistic point is that 28 EU member states having resident diplomatic missions in New Delhi also proves this point that the EU-India relationship is pretty strong and, and will keep going. But the major point also being that at the 12th EU-India summit, a security roadmap, as was mentioned, uh, was signed outlining cooperation in counterterrorism, cyber terrorism, joint piracy efforts, which were all very new things at that time, and important landmarks of India EU relationship, which were laid down. These have now been far more ratified and taken up by the uh, latest Porto Declaration. ASEAN, too, definitely is in this equation because of the dynamic interaction of a growing or grown unified economy and motivations, some of which converge with India, India and EU. Further, the setting up of the Quad uh, really, I mean, was an idea which was brought about uh, 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 with ASEAN, India, uh, EU, and the two large sectors which were involved over here were tourism and environment, which would be good for both uh, EU and India, and of course the ASEAN. So the, uh, the aim was really peace and world peace and environment, even though it's become a cliche, but this was the aim. In this context, Quad became essential to the discussion. 
the quadrilateral security dialogue between Japan, US, Australia, and India was revived in November 2017, mainly to halt China's might in the South Seas and the Indian Ocean, the Indo-Pacific. And I'm glad that the EU is now taking it very seriously that the Indo-Pacific needs to be looked at. Even in COVID times, you find 25th November 2020, navies of Australia, India, Japan, US held their biggest drills, sending warships, submarines, aircraft to the Indian Ocean in a move that analysts said signaled the four countries' seriousness in countering China, China's military and political influence in the Indo-Pacific especially. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, Porto um, uh, Declaration, the cooperation between Indian Navy has kind of uh, taken root uh, with, with the uh, UNAV 4 in the Pacific region. So it means a start of a terrific initiative, which has been taken just now. You have policy recommendations for both EU and India, which has been discussed, trade, counterterrorism, maritime security. And over here, I think, as discussed by the other ambassadors, uh, uh, I think cooperation would be really welcomed and uh, would look good. Would rationalize world order, truly practice democracy, and have a right bouquet of agendas to, to kind of you know, come through with it. Uh, EU stands firm, solidarity and support one knows to oxygen ventilators, a hundred million dollar uh, kind of an aid to India, because India had also done well for the EU in the first uh, uh, wave, during the first wave. And also one of the interesting statements at the Porto Declaration was, India delivers the goals it sets up, which is very, very creditable. And therefore, uh, EU is also looking at India as a stable, inevitably veritable partner. Also mentioned was India as powerhouse of digitization. Uh, the Portuguese Prime Minister, Mr. Costa, said one more very interesting thing, and this is towards the quad, uh, the quad also, and which was mentioned by the ambassador here. It is multilateralism. I think it is a very good way of trying to get to achieving the initiatives uh, in terms of the geostrategic, uh, geodefining, uh, people to people cooperation, opening doors, and uh, enhancing engagement and setting up the global economy. What came through very uh, sharply was social and economic rights, especially as the pandemic is on and we cannot ignore the pandemic, uh, particularly gender rights, gender based non discrimination, and things which Parliament can come through. Uh, one of the major things that I do want to say is that uh, China comes up as the wolf warrior, as we have been discussing. There were three, uh, three areas where it kind of defined its insecurity, but it also made the other nations insecure. Japan over the Senkaku Islands, South Korea, Suyan Rock, Taiwan, various issues, and South China Seas, and also try to tighten the pearl necklace uh, on India with uh, Hambantota in Sri Lanka, Gwadar Port in Pakistan, BRI, and the uh, CPEC with advantage China. So I think the EU also realized that they have to come to some kind of not just India's aid, but try to uh, uh, have a straight uh, you know, um, uh, issue um, uh, enhan uh, enhancement with Indian goals as such. It also realized, you realize that the third best Navy after China and Japan in the East is the Indian Navy. Uh, coming to the uh, shared values, common uh, ideas and common destiny, it made it more and more clear that EU has to come in and participate in the quadrilateral alliance uh, over here. And the Porto meeting reinforced the India-EU strategic partnership, reiterating, as I said again, uh, democracy, freedom, rule of law, and also, as you mentioned, the UNCLOS to be brought in for the idea of the uh, seas to be protected, and a new con connectivity uh, over here also. 
uh, in the EU uh, India partnership, the international treaty on pandemics has to go parallel with the quadrilateral uh, agreement. And this I'm trying to bring into fresh play because it needs market accessibility, investment protection. It also means a lot of militarization, securitization in this part of the world, uh, taking into consideration global digital standards. And for example, it had also had a joint task force on artificial intelligence earlier. The EU strategy for cooperation with the India Pacific, uh, I think of Indo in the Indo Pacific, as a professor once wrote, Harimoto, that it should strive for sharing the concept of multilateralism for each of their interests, for the EU interests and for the basic regional principle of uh, both India and uh, uh, India and the in EU. So the three are very much linked together, India, EU, ASEAN to the quad, to the quad and since 2017 have been linked, but they need a more, uh, they need a more uh, uh, kind of enhancement, so to speak, in terms of the India, uh, EU security uh, uh, ideology that has to be put in place. And one uh, important thing over here is, the issue of terrorism, which had been brought about in 2010 also, and that EU has to do much more, not just have delegations in terms of Kashmir, for example, as an issue of terrorism, has to come into the matrix and recognize Pakistan, not bring it down in every sphere, but contextualize it in order to find out that it is one of the uh, very delicate points which India also has to face. Even during the pandemic, there has been a high incidence of deaths and there has been a high incidence of uh, terrorist activities. So there has to be an action plan which began 2005, then 2009, 2010, and now it needs to get into more action after the Porto uh, uh, meeting. And this, the Porto meeting seems to have really wrapped it up and EU and India seem to be moving in the right direction with the right bouquet of agendas in order to rationalize world order and multilateralism, which India really needs now to have a kind of a commitment from the EU nations as discussed by the other ambassadors and by USA. So you have to have an Indo-Pacific initiative leading to cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region, not just a beginner, but as a very uh, set up uh, roadmap. And uh, I think this is going to happen and be a new chapter as the uh, Portuguese Prime Minister, Mr. Costa, put across in the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much for picking out uh, these special points uh, in during this meeting and uh, something which we hadn't heard from the others. So it's um, you know, rounded it off very well. Thank you so much. And now I think we are uh, nearing uh, towards the end of the session. So I have very few minutes left to ask questions. So I'm going to bunch the questions together. Uh, and uh, the first set of questions uh, will be on mobility issues, uh, which is by... Uh, uh, Sita Sharma, Technical Officer, EU India Project of the ILO. Uh, what she says is that trade and mobility go together, but there remain many barriers to mobility, is, uh, and that is um, addressing the return of irregular migrants like it has for the UK. Is that on the cards for India with the EU? Uh, the other part of this question is the soft power approach involves the diaspora, but the engagement with the European diaspora has not been very strategic so far what is expected in the coming time. And the last part of this question is the trade agreement will have a labor component, either included or in parallel. How can we ensure trade union engagement in this? So um, uh, who would like to take this question? <coughs> can I turn to Mr. Surin Gate for answering this question, please? Well, you, you raise a very... Uh important issue and, and serious issue and of course there is something to be discussed to be honest with you I can't I can't give you an answer right now because the, the, this um, 
migration issue <clears throat> is really, you know, high on the agenda in many countries in Europe. And, and um, uh, how should I put it in the di diplomatic way? Maybe an ambassador will help me. But, you, you know, th this is something that um, uh, divides some countries and, uh, in Europe because they have diff different um, uh, solutions to those uh, problems. But I, I fully agree that that could also be part or should also be part of an, uh, of an agreement. And I think I will leave it here and maybe... Um, uh, one of the ambassadors has a, a, a better answer, maybe a, a little closer to to the council on on this issue. But but I know that it is uh, heavily discussed uh, both in the parliament and also in the national parliament. So that was not an answer; that was just a remark. Right. So there is, a, of course, a re related question to this by Narsad Hodiwala, country coordinator for India ICM uh, PD Brussels. Uh, looking forward to learning more about the summit's conclusions on people-to-people -people mobility and the EU-India CAMM. So, um, if anybody else has an answer to this here, yes, Ambassador Vincenzo, yes, please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Anil. I uh, just want to add some remarks because Italy hosts, as you know, the largest uh, Indian community in uh, European Union since 30 years they are very much integrated in the agro-industry sector in Italy. We have also increased the number of students in the Italian universities. Now we have more than 5,000 uh, Indian students. Uh, it was a, a recent increase in this number. And we are also negotiated some further agreement with the uh, Ministry of External Affairs on Mobility. We have delivered last uh, 2019, of course, because last year was a COVID year. <laughs> in a way, and in 2019, we delivered 130,000 visa to uh, Indians uh, moving to Italy and to Europe. So I think there is a potential also there to further improve the exchange and mobility and also attract. But I agree also with uh, Dinesh that we should also encourage more students from Europe to India. And that's uh, another opportunity we have to, uh, especially in some sectors also, both in the uh, culture and tradition and uh, academy, but also innovation. I see a lot of uh, interest in Italy also for uh, uh, joining a startup, matchmaking startup between uh, Europe and India and some area. So I, be, I see, uh, and also I want to add to what uh, Dinesh said that, uh, of course, we have discussed these uh, uh, principles and sectors since uh, many years. But now I see more political momentum vis-a-vis -vis the past uh, um, summit or uh, uh, meetings between the uh, European Union and India. More political momentum and also, I would add, more awareness in the business community. Because in the year 2020, a year very difficult for COVID, India was the first recipient of foreign direct investment in the world, plus 13% when all the world had the minus 42% in foreign direct investment. We launched from Italy 12 new investment projects here in India. That means there is a potential still there. And there is a lot to do more, but there is a more awareness in the business community. You have to work on this, on the uh, increasing, uh, increased awareness in the companies, in the manager, in the entrepreneurs, in the business community to do more here and to work together in the framework of uh, making India. We have not uh, touched this point, but this is a very important point. Making India for us is making India with Europe, with Italy. We can invest here, produce here, not only for the Indian market, but also for other countries. And we have to attract, we can attract more investment from India to Europe, to the, especially after Brexit. I think there is a potential there. Thank you very if much. If I may, Chair, yeah, yeah. yes, yes, a, a, a positive remark, because I'm very much engaged in um, enterprises in Europe, and especially, of course, in the northern part of, 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 of Europe. And I must say, uh, and it's very important for me, a lot of big companies, they, they couldn't manage without their backbone functions being in India. And there's a big pressure f from many companies in Europe to, to face and to solve the problem. You, Chair, uh, rightly raised because they really want it to become easier 
for those um, young people from uh, India who want to go to uh, Europe either just for some years or for a longer period of their, their, their life. So I, I think it, it, it will be looked into and the press is there for business community because uh, you have so many uh, skilled uh, people and a lot of companies have good uh, relations and good experiences by doing business, having employees in, uh, inside India. Thank you. Uh, but we have, uh, you know, uh, three or four other sets of questions, uh, but uh, they are basically on India-EU collaboration. That's the first subset. There's also questions on health and vaccines, which uh, the panelists uh, had uh, answered during uh, their discourses uh, just now. There are a few questions on the Indian Ocean, Indo-Pacific, etc. And finally, on EU-India trade relationship. Uh, a couple of questions which are also on the soft power aspect of the EU-India relationship. Uh, I believe during the course of uh, the panelists' uh, remarks, uh, we have covered uh, most of these questions. The only uh, question which I would like to ask, if any of the panelists would like to answer this, Yes, Ambassador, I think we can have one concluded remarks from all the speakers, one by one. I think we start with Ambassador Vincenzo. He is the senior most and the most good looking of all of us. <laughs> uh, my final remark is that uh, we have uh, to work uh, more and we have uh, all the conditions now established to work on trade, investment, on technology, on energy transition, this is very, very important challenge. And I think we can share not only experience, but also technology and know-how. Um, but uh, I am optimistic about this evolution. Uh, it's true that uh, it's a long-standing uh, partnership, but now I think we have uh, in a sort of uh, point where we can do more, we can work on a long-term view and also being conscious of the importance of these relations. And uh, from Italy, we have uh, increased our presence here. We will do more in all the sectors, in the economic field, in the cultural field. And also, I agree with Dinesh, uh, sharing experience in the democratic uh, uh, life because, uh, for example, last uh, few months we had uh, a meeting of a friendship group between the two parliaments. Also, the parliaments are a very important part of this dialogue. We have not mentioned until now, but uh, parliaments are part of this process, should be part, important part of this process because all the legislation go through the parliaments here in, in India and in Europe, and we have a, a common uh, uh, experience in uh, democratic uh, uh, life. So I think uh, this is uh, the conclusion today that uh, we are really experiencing a moment in the uh, a, a momentum in the, in, in the uh, in re um, re relation between Europe and India, and we will uh, give our contribution as Italy certainly. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Apologies for my going off also momentarily because of technical glitch. But I'd like to now hand over back to Kanchi uh, to conclude the session. Ambassador, we were planning to have on concluding remarks from all the speakers. All right. Yeah. So we can uh, have... Ambassador Vincenzo has already said, I think Ambassador Robin should be the next to say his concluding remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be a part of this panel. Um, I really liked uh, Ambassador Dinesh Patnaik's ideas about culture and about uh, European students coming to India. Now, I would like to share with you a small secret, when not secret, uh, when I was young, I was looking for scholarships around the world and India was on my radar. Unfortunately, it did not happen uh, to me to come here as a student, but, you know, destiny later brought me here as a high commissioner. But, I, you know, looking back, it would have been a, a wonderful experience had I, had I opted to, to come and study here in India. I just wanted also to make a comment, uh, which my colleague Vincenzo, he, he said that in, in Italy, 
there is a vibrant uh, Indian community, uh, even in Malta. You know, I mean, it's a small country, the smallest in the EU. Uh, when we compare with the Indian population, you know, like we are almost half a million. So, but uh, our by percentage, the the Indians' presence in Malta is quite large. Um, we need the Maltese economy needs Indian workers from all fields, and in fact, this COVID business has put us in a situation when we have where we have to answer emails and phone calls uh, on a daily basis as to why we are not uh, issuing uh, enough, we were not issuing visas to, to workers which are required in Malta, uh, like water, Indian workers, which are required like Mal in Malta, like water in the desert. It's also interesting to point out that given our uh, British colony past, uh, the Indian f presence in Malta dates back to the 19th century. So uh, there are Indian families in Malta who go back to that time. And uh, as I like to repeat uh, a lot, I hope I'm not boring you having, to, if, you have, if you have heard me say it before, but the main street of Malta used to have Indian textile shops. So everybody used to see them. Everybody knew about them because they were in the main street of Malta. It used to be called Royal Street, now it's Republic Street. And uh, up until the 80s and the 90s, uh, the main textile shops in Main Street Valletta, Republic Street Valletta, were owned by, by Indian, who became Maltese, you know, I mean, in, in, by Indian Maltese, if I, if I may say so. Uh, I don't want to continue. Uh, I think I've said enough. Thank you very much. Thank you. As um, my final remark, I just wanted to say I completely support what Ambassador Vincenzo said that there is today a greater political will between Europe and India to resolve issues. And I completely agree with him because that's what is necessary. All the others, we can only delineate the issues. All of us know the issues. I mean, it's not as if we're inventing something new. The EU-India relationship is an old relationship, is a relationship where we all know where the problems lie. All we need right now is the right political will of the leadership to be able to go forward. We can only, between us, discuss what the issues are and we know what it is. But if we can work on the political will and make sure that the experiences of the past, what we have learned from the past, of the mistakes we have made in the past, of the good things we have done in the past, if we can take it forward, this is a relationship which has huge potential. And I hope that we move from potential to reality and not always keep you, India, as a relationship of potentiality. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, can I come in? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I agree with, of course, most of what was said. But I also think that the Indo-Pacific, since I've been given that uh, with, with a total focus on it, uh, can go forward, provided that the pandemic also plays uh, non havoc with us and we are able to get through this because we have our own tensions and securities uh, in the Indian Ocean and on our borders. So we we'll have to learn to manage it and I hope the European Union realizes our own sensitivities and transgressions and, and uh, we are able to deal with most of them but maybe not all of them and I hope really that we have a working beautiful uh, democracy in which we can solve these problems and go ahead to, uh, you know, also having a great uh, friendship between India and the European Union in all these quarters that we have discussed. It's been a very pleasurable panel. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I think, uh, Kachi, I'd like to like sorry. you to sum up. Sorry. Sorry. Anyone else? Which if 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 I may just a remark on something that we haven't touched so much upon today, uh, being a former minister of defence, security is, is on my mind, and I really do hope that we can also use this um, our new partnership, so to speak, on security. I think it's very important for uh, the European Union, who is really a soft power. They can't. Uh, do uh, much by their own military-wise, but it's also important we develop 
a security partnership with India. And I do think that it's also important that the European Union support uh, India in getting a, a permanent seat in the United Nations uh, Security Council. And that could also be something that could be, be touched upon uh, when we do uh, elaborate on our partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ambassador Vadva, would you like to summarize this session? Well, I would like to say that uh, we had, uh, you know, diverse uh, views which were expressed and I think all the panelists complemented themselves uh, very well with each other. Um, I think what has emerged is that uh, despite the fact that we have um, a number of years of, uh, of very important documents which have come out, um, what we need to do is to actually put this into practice and achieve the potential that exists between the relationship between India and the EU. We also need to pay more attention to the areas that we've not focused upon, culture for one and uh, security, uh, you know, as far as uh, Surin uh, Gade pointed out. Uh, so these are issues that uh, we need to focus in uh, as well in order to give this a very uh, comprehensive character to this relationship. Uh, and thank you very much for all the panelists for your wonderful views. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Vadva. So now we have come to the end of the third and final session of this webinar. I would like to convey my appreciation to all the moderators and speakers for their time and support and contributing to this webinar, as well as our team for the organization of this event in these challenging circumstances. I thank you all participants most warmly for your participation and wish you all the good luck and health. Thank you. Thank you.